Greetings. This is the solutions to the practice questions for week four. So first of all, question one, when a firm purchases a long-term asset, all of the following costs are considered to be part of the acquisition, except, so which one is not in there? Well, obviously we're going to include the purchase price, the obvious one. Setup and preparation costs, yep, yeah, that's all part and parcel of it. We're looking at C, costs to train and um, uh, costs to train the employees and use the asset. Yep, because we're going, um, you know, the asset would be not usable until those costs were incurred. And then we get to the fourth one. Yeah, annual insurance costs to protect the asset. Uh, that's just a regular expense and would go through as part of the expense of the business. Now, to the extent that you needed to insure the asset in transit, maybe coming from a supplier on the other side of the world, or um, during construction costs, there might be insurance costs, then those would be part of the acquisition cost, but not, you know, it doesn't say that, it just says annual insurance costs, so the answer is D. Question 2. Which of the following statements reflect the similarities between amortisation and depreciation? And we know they're both similar, it's just that amortisation tends to apply to intangible assets and depreciation is the term that we use when we're looking at property, plant and equipment, so tangibles. Anyway, they're both methods of adjusting the cost of an asset to its market value. No, they're not absolutely. Depreciation is nothing to do with market value. It might be an approximation. If it is, though, it's just a fluke, so it's not that. They're both applications of the matching concept. That certainly sounds reasonable, because we know what we're doing is matching the cost of the asset, um, setting the cost of the asset against the periods where revenue is being generated. So that looks likely. Let's hope that the others are wrong. Their calculations always involve allocations based on time. Well, absolutely not. We know that we can have um, units of production method, which has nothing to do with time. And they're both recognizing both methods of recognizing the cash used in maintaining the asset. No, obviously not. So the only answer is C. Question three: Accounting for a capital expenditure as compared to accounting for a revenue expenditure. And what we mean by it is a funny term that gets used in accounting. Revenue expenditure is one that we're going to treat as an expense within the period and set it against revenue within the period. Uh, it's actually more of, uh, important from a tax concept that in general when you're computing taxable income then the tax code says that you don't get any deduction for capital expenditures, in other words expenditures which are going to bring benefits over a number of periods. So, A impacts the total book value of the plant assets reported on the balance sheet and the amount of net income reported during the period. Uh, So I I think this is a peculiar question. I don't really like the wording of this. I think what they're getting at is saying that if we have an expenditure which ought to have been treated as a revenue expenditure but was instead treated as a capital expenditure, so let's say there's some uh, item of maintenance on the machine, so if it was maintenance, regular maintenance, it should have been treated as a regular expense, but instead it was capitalised, what happens to that? Well, it impacts the total value of plant assets. Yes, it does, because it will have capitalised it, and it amounts the it affects the amount of net income, because the net income will be too high because the expenses are too low. So it has to be that one, I think. B impacts the total book value of the assets on the balance sheet. Yes, it does, but has no effect. Well, no, we just said it, it does affect the net income, because the expenses are understated. Impacts the amount of net income but has no effect on the balance sheet one well, no, again, so it can't be that. Has no impact on other, no, it can't be that either. So there is just one correct answer. Now the next question. Finifta Company purchased a truck on January the 1st, 2010 for a price as given. At that time, the truck's estimated useful life was going to be four years with no salvage value. And so the original depreciation was to write off the depreciable base and the depreciable base is the cost less the estimated salvage value which of course nothing so we have this depreciable base we're going to say that 36,000 has to be written off over the life and it was originally going to be four years 
So that gives us $9,000 per year. Okay, we're then told that on January the 1st, 2013, so at this stage, we've had all of 2010, we've had all of 2012, 11, we've had all of 2012, so that's three years, right? And on that date, the truck's useful life was extended by an additional two years. So originally they thought it was going to be four years, they're three years in, so they thought it had one year's life left in it, but it turns out it's actually got an additional two, so that implies three years to come. And so they say, oh, uh, and now what's a straight line depreciation in the future? And so from 2013 onwards, 2013, 2014, 2015, they're going to write off the net book value down to its salvage value over the remaining estimated useful life, the three year period. And so we have a net book value on January the 1st, 2013 of um, well it will be the cost of 36,000 less the three years worth of depreciation at 9,000 per year which is of course 27,000 so that gives us a net book value on this date of 9,000 we have the new estimate of the salvage value which we think is 900 and so the depreciable base depreciable base is 8100 and we're going to write that off over the three year period three years to come and so that gives us a depreciation of twenty seven hundred dollars per year and so the answer is d the next question is about a company that purchases something new frequency modulation transmitter for a price the company has determined something or other and the question is determine the book value of the equipment after two years assuming the transmitter was used okay and we can see they've got this hours usage it's obviously using a units of production method um, doesn't actually explicitly tell us they're like, using the units of production but that's the only sensible thing and so we'd say that the depreciable base remember is the cost of 17,000 less the estimated salvage value of 2,000 so the depreciable base is 15,000 the estimated useful life is 30,000 hours so divided by 30,000 hours is again think of the dimensions of this dollars divided by hours gives us 50 cents per hour the usage in the first year was 10,000 hours in the second year was 5,000 hours and so the total depreciation in the first two years together is 15,000 hours, the 10,000 plus 5, multiplied by the depreciation rate of 50 cents per hour, which is $7,500. And therefore, the net book value is the cost minus the depreciation, accumulated depreciation to date, which is the 17,000 minus 7,500. And so that gives us 9,500. And the answer is C. Okay, the next question is about determining a depreciation expense recorded on this date. And it's, um, okay, it's, uh, Apparently, uh, it's accounting period of December 31. And so, oh, this is going to be sneaky because they bought the asset partway through one year. And then we want the depreciation expense for the second year of ownership. But it's not, it's not, it's not all of month 13 to month 24. It's month something else to something else. So we know that the company uses a double declining balance method. We have a cost of 180,000, 10 year useful life, residual value of something which under double declining balance, remember, is irrelevant, so we don't care about that. Uh, 10 year useful life implies that the double declining balance rate is twice the straight line rate, so that's two times 100% over the 10 year life, right, which would be 10% per year, and so this is 20%. So in any one year, the depreciation is 20% of 
of the beginning year balance. And so in 2014, we would have a depreciation expense of 20% of the beginning of year balance, or in this case, uh, ownership balance. So 20% times the cost, 180,000, but we're only going to take not a full 20%, we're only going to take the fraction of the year. And so that's going to be multiplied by 8 twelfths. And so 20% 0.2 multiplied by 180,000 multiplied by 8 twelfths gives us 24,000. And so the net book value of the asset, January 1st, 20. 15 is going to be the cost of 180,000 less the accumulated depreciation to date 24,000 so 180 less 24 that gives us a net book value of 156,000 and so the depreciation expense in 2015 and then now of course it's a full 12 months worth and so it's going to be 20% of the net book value at the beginning of the period, 20% of 156,000, which is, so multiplied by 0.2, gives us 31,200. That's uh, quite a tricky question, so answer is B. Okay, next question, Hurl Company purchased commercial dishwasher, what's this about? It's about for what amount will the company record the dishwasher? So we're looking at which of these expenses are capitalizable, which of those we're going to write off during the period. So uh, compass, uh, company purchased commercial dishwasher paying cash of 5,000. The dishwasher's fair value on the date of the purchase was 5,600. Well, what on earth does that mean? Given that they've just bought it for 5,000, that seems pretty strong evidence that its value was 5,000. But maybe it's a bargain purchase, but we're obviously going to use the value in exchange. $5,000 cash paid, we ignore what someone asserts is the fair value. The company incurred $400 in transportation costs. That's obviously relevant. Uh, $300 installation fees. That's obviously relevant. So we have $5,000 plus the transportation plus the installation. That would be reasonable. And paid a $200 fine for illegal parking while the dishwasher was being delivered. Obviously not. We're not. That's, uh, was not anything to do really with the cost of the dishwasher, and so we'd say the total is fifty-seven hundred, and so that's the answer. Question eight: Gradone Company acquired a dump truck that cost sixty-five thousand. The company estimated it could sell the truck for eleven thousand at the end of its estimated useful life of five years. Though apparently didn't keep that. Assuming double declining balance depreciation, determine the selling price of the truck if it was actually sold for a gain of $11,000. That doesn't make $11,000 gain at the end of its second full year of use. So we need to work backwards and say, well, if the gain was $11,000, um, what was the cash proceeds? Well, it must have been the cash proceeds were the net book value plus 11,000 and so we need to know what was the netbook value at the end of its second year. So they use double declining balance and so remember salvage value is irrelevant. All we do is we say that the depreciation in year one is double declining balance estimated life of five years so the straight line rate would be 20% and so the double declining balance rate would be twice that of 40%. So the depreciation in year one is 40% of the original cost of 65,000. So 40% times 65 is 26,000. Then in fact, what you can also do is say, if the depreciation's 40%, then we know that the ending this might be quicker in this case, the ending net book value is 60%, right, 100 minus 40%, 60% times beginning net book value. And so in this case, 
we have a cost of 65,000 multiplied by 0.6, that gives us an ending net book value of 39,000. And of course, we could also get that 39,000 by saying, oh, well, it's 65,000 cost minus the depreciation expense for the year or accumulated depreciation at the end of the year of 26,000 gives us the net book value of 39,000. But you can see this method is gonna be now slightly quicker for year two because we can say net book value end of year two is equal to 60% of the net book value at beginning of year two, which is 60% of 39,000. So 39,000 multiplied by 0.6 is 23,400. And given that there was a gain of 11,000, we said the sale proceeds were net book value plus 11,000. So this is equal to 23,000, 23,400 plus 11,000. So it must be that the cash proceeds were, what's that? Um, 34,400. So 34,400. The next question, Finnamore Corporation again. Finnamore Corporation sold equipment for $3,000, which it had used for several years. The equipment had cost 13,000. Its accumulated depreciation was 9,000 at the date of sale. What are the net effects on the accounting equation of selling the equipment? Uh, okay, so let's think about it. The net book value was 9,000, sorry, net book value was cost of 13 less accumulated depreciation of nine. So the net book value at the date of disposal was 13 less nine, which is 4,000. And so what happens as a result of this? Well, we can see that the assets, think of the basic balance sheet, equation, we have assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Well, as a result of this transaction, the fixed assets go down by 4,000 because the company no longer has that. The asset goes up, the cash goes up by 3,000. So overall, there's a decline in assets of 1,000. Right, the net of the increase of three and the decrease of four. There's obviously no change in liabilities, and so it must be that owner's equity goes down by one, and indeed it does. It's a loss on disposal of fixed assets. So assets and owner's equity both increase. No, they don't. We just said they decreased. Assets and assets decrease, owner's equity, no, it doesn't. And so we can see that this one, assets and owner's equity both decrease by 1,000. The next question, question 10. Uh, something about determining the book value of a tractor on this date. Uh, they tell us company purchased something for 60,000 in 2012. The company, uh, the tractor, the asset has an estimated salvage value of 10,000, 10, 10,000 hours life of operation. So obviously expected to use units of production method. They tell us how long the asset was used for in 2012, 2013 and they tell us the company decided to sell it, but nothing about sale proceeds. So this fact is completely irrelevant. All we really care about is what the question is, what's the book value? So we know we have a cost of 60,000. We have a estimated salvage value of 10,000 over here, right? So that gives us a depreciable base of 50,000. And so divided by the estimated productive life of 10,000 hours, that gives us a rate, I can remember this is hours, this is dollars. So $50,000 divided by 10,000 hours is $5 per hour. And so the depreciation 
recorded in 2012 would be 2400 hours at five dollars per hour in 2013 2100 at five dollars per hour probably easier to put them both together so in aggregate 4500 hours at five dollars per hour so 4500 multiplied by five is uh, 22,500 and so the question was what was the book value the book value was cost of 60,000 less accumulated depreciation to date of 22,500 so 6000 less 22500 whoops believe that is 37,500 is that a choice yes it is good and now some questions on liabilities so question 11 unearned revenues what are unearned revenues remember unearned revenues arise when a customer pays us some money up front which is nice so we have the cash in the bank but then we have this obligation which is why it's a liability we have the obligation to do something for the customer so unearned revenues what are they are they a right type of revenue uh, no not yet they will be in the future but they're certainly not at the date we're calling them sort of by definition I mean there are no I mean they're, they're a liability they're revenues that are collected before services or goods are delivered um, that's probably true that's not the best way of putting it but it's, it seems okay do they normally have a debit balance no they're absolutely not they're they we know they normally have a credit balance so that's it and then are credited when the sales revenue is finally in? no absolutely not I mean we know that they're they're credited when the cash is received not when the sales revenue is finally earned if anything that we have this obligation which is a liability is you know, so a credit balance it's actually debited when the sales revenue is finally earned and so that's not my favorite wording but the the best wording is B item 12 um, contingent liability what's a contingent liability it's something which um, we think might happen we're not sure whether it's going to happen or not or we're not sure about the amount and so there's quite a lot of uncertainty about it and so let's see it's probably going to be one where we don't agree with any of the words 100 percent but let's see which are the closest so a contingent liability is a potential liability that depends on a future event arising out of a past transaction um, that's actually yeah pretty good definition so that seems likely let's see if there's anything better is a liability that can always be calculated with great precision or it, no it's not absolutely it does not have I mean you can't use precision it doesn't have a definite amount so it's absolutely not that one does it does not include product safety no it doesn't that's the whole point it's the classic example of a contingent liability so that's not true does not include liabilities again again classic example of a contingent liability and so the only good answer is indeed a Question 13. Justin Company signed a $45,000 90-day 9% note payable on December the 1st, 2005. If the accounting period ends on December 31, 2005, the entry made on the note's maturity, March the 1st, 2006, will include, well, what they do on March the 1st, 2006 depends on what they did on December 31st, 2005, and there's different ways of accounting for it. But let's guess that what they would have done would be on December 31, they would record the interest expense for the interest that was rolling up on this note. So they probably debited interest expense and credited interest payable on the interest that would roll up during the month of December. And how much would that be? Well, it'd be 45,000 multiplied by 9% the annual interest rate and then multiplied by a twelfth because it was a twelfth of a year so 45,000 multiplied by 0 0.09 divided by 12 gives us $337.50 so I'm guessing that they did this so debit interest expense $337.50 
credit interest payable, $337.50. And then on March the 1st, 2006, when they settled it, almost certainly there would be a debit to interest payable. There would be a debit to interest expense for the two months worth of interest. And so if it was $337.50 for one month, it would be twice that for the January and February. So multiplied by two gives us 675. And then there'd be a credit to cash for 675. And maybe we would actually merge that entry together with the repayment of the principal in as well. So maybe it was a credit to cash for 45,675 and a debit, an initial debit to note payable, but that doesn't seem uh, that what they're talking about here. So would it be a debit to interest payable for 675? No, it wouldn't, because I mean, at best they would know it would be a debit to interest payable for $337.50, so it's not that. Would it be a debit to interest expense for that amount? Probably not. I'm guessing we'll carry on. In fact, some of the accounting methods, you, we could have had that, and it would depend whether they'd actually use what's called reversing entry, but I'm guessing it's not this one. Would it be a debit to interest expense for 337.50? No, it wouldn't. It would be for two months. And so would it be a debit to interest expense for 675? So yes, it would. Um, as I say, there is actually a way of doing the accounting where we use what are called reversing entries, where this would be a correct answer. But I don't think we've covered that. We haven't taught you the accounting that way in this textbook. And so the answer they're looking for is clearly D. Question 14. Most employers are required to withhold from employees which of the following taxes? So this is talking about withholding taxes. And so what gets deducted from employees' pay? Well, there's obviously the um, employees' share of Social Security, what we technically call FICA. So employees' share of FICA. And then there's also income tax, which is withheld and then again has to be handed over. So is it the FICA tax? Well, yes, it is, but it looks like there might be a better one. Is it FICA tax, state and federal unemployment compensation? No, the, uh, the unemployment taxes is not paid by the employee. It's not withheld from the employee's wage. It's an additional tax that's payable by the employer based on earnings. So it's nothing to do with unemployment. Oh, and that's to do with unemployment. That, okay, so there is only one answer. Strictly, it should be FICA and income tax, but of the answers given, A is clearly the best. Question 15. An example of a contingent liability is, well, we talked about those earlier as to what sort of things are, the things where we're not sure either of the timing or the amounts or indeed whether or not there would be a liability. So is it a bond that can be converted into common stock? No, it's not. That would be a straightforward liability, so it's not that. Is it any interest-bearing liability? No, again, that's not contingent. We know exactly what it is. Is it the unrealised loss from a reduction in the fair value of a long-term liability? Well, no, if anything, the reduction in the fair value of a long-term liability would be a gain, not, not a loss, and there's nothing contingent about it, so it's not that. Is it a lawsuit? Well, it's not the lawsuit itself which is contingent liability. It's the loss that's going to arise out of that lawsuit, but given the wording, this is the least bad answer, and so the answer is D.